Well, we've got a minute before we officially start, but I saw you started the recording a while ago. So, um, so this evening, um, I might as well kick things off. Bud's feeling a little under the weather, so uh, I'm going to be doing most of the talking so he doesn't have to. And uh, right now, it looks like I see nine of us, and that's it. So. Um, I understand Steve, uh, AG7GN, has some things for us tonight. Um, Steve Stroh, did you have some things? Yes, for Bud. Okay. Okay. And uh, anybody else got anything want to throw into the uh, kettle? Hey, Randy. Well, uh, might as well get started. Uh, who'd like to go first, Steve or Steve? <laughs> Steve Strell, why don't you go ahead? Okay, give me a second. Uh, let's see, I share. Okay, um, so Bud suggested that I present a few excerpts out of my newsletter, Zero Retries. And uh, so I grabbed a few interesting things for this month. Um, I'm going to talk about some microphone adapters from Tigertronics that I didn't know about until I actually looked at the Tigertronics website a little more closely. Um, some interesting adapters to allow more than one modem. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to fix this there. Um, some adapters that allow more than one modem to share a single radio. Uh, there's a new 225 uh, megahertz radio out from Mo from Alinko. Um, and also a, um, U a technique that I thought was interesting about sharing USB over Ethernet um, and for a particular application. Okay. So uh, this is an example of the Tigertronics uh, microphone adapters. There's two of them, one for RJ11 jacks and RJ45 jacks for um, microphones that have the six-pin inner six-pin connector and an, and an eight-pin connector. And the the cool thing about these is that you can have uh, a data device um, modem. Um, such as the Nexus DRX connected and the microphone connected, and then you can toggle back and forth very easily with these. Um, they don't just share the microphone, they also share the speaker output. Um, so um, these would let you, you know, give, get some capability back on a, on a, on a uh, radio that you were um, previously using only for data. Or, or manually switching cables, and this makes it a lot easier. Again, these are two separate units for the two different connectors, and these have been available for quite some time. Um, so, nor, you know, they're, and they're sized the same, same as the uh, Tigertronics um, USB audio interface. Um, this is, this is, one of the master's communications uh, audio adapters. And this is a multiplexer, um, an audio multiplexer. So this audio, you can have two audio interfaces connected simultaneously to the same radio through one of these. And the cool thing about these is that they isolate, electrically isolate each adapter. So for example, when you're transmitting from one, the other modem that's not being used is not loading down the audio. Um, the, the master's communications is the guys who, or the, the guy, I guess, uh, Kevin, um, who makes the fantastic audio adapters for the really high speed stuff like, um, FARA FM. Um, so these, these are nice because you don't have to switch. You just 
you know, use one or the other and they can stay connected full time. Hmm. And obviously you can't use both modems simultaneously. Um, this is an interesting one that I, I did not know about. And it's called a Mux 25 and it's for repeaters. So you can, um, it was originally intended for um, an FM repeater that you wanted to be able to do digital voice on either DSTAR or DMR. And it lets you have both capabilities on the same repeater. Um, again, you can't use both at the same time, obviously, but, um, and, and there, this is very well-developed technology that I just kind of stumbled across because the, the Masters Communications website is just, <laughs> just incredible numbers of uh, devices. Oh. Um, this is the Alinko DRCS25T. It's, it's, it, I had originally mentioned it in Zero Retries as a rumor. It's now, it's, it's not a rumor anymore, it's real. Um, what's cool about this is that it lets you get into um, 222 megahertz um, at a reasonable price point, $260 from HRO. And again, this is a new radio. This is not an Obtanium like it used to be or you know Chinese vendor du jour. Um, the, the, if you haven't been following the you can buy the same radio variously from uh, multiple claimed vendors on Amazon for 220, et cetera. Um, that's, that was for a while, quite a while, the only way to get a mono band 220 radio. There's a new, they've reintroduced a radio from, I uh, can't remember the vendor's name now, the guys in Missouri. Sorry, I'm just blanking on it. But it was when they reintroduced that, and that radio actually has a dedicated data interface. Um, trouble is that radio is around a $350 price point, whereas this is $260, much more reasonable. Now, the downside is that this one does not have, not only does this one not have a dedicated data interface, but it's also got the old-fashioned round microphone connector, so you can't use the, the, the switches. You'd have to, you know, kind of use some cabling magic to, you know, convert from the round microphone connector to, which exists. Those 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 adapter cables exist out there, especially for data use. Um, but uh, the, and uh, the thing that I like about 220 is that it you can use it simultaneously. I do it all the time in my shack. Um, I have a tri-band antenna um, with a um, triplexer. Um, I have a dedicated 220 radio, and I have a two, uh, 144 and 440 radio all connected to the same antenna, and they, you know, they, they work at, all at the same time. So it's really nice to have that dedicated um, data radio that you know, can be on regardless of what you're doing on 2 meters or 440. Mm -hmm. um, so in this... Uh, slide is just words. I don't have a good illustration for this one. This came out of a discussion or a, a, a discussion I was having in Zero Retries about uh, installing micro about installing software defined radio modules. They're going to be operating at microwave frequencies like 2.4 and above um, directly onto a tower or a pole right next to the antenna because the not only are the uh, feed line losses at microwave frequencies pretty severe unless you get really good coax or actually feed line like hard line um, but the sdrs have very low power output so you're losing a lot if you try to push a, a signal you know from a low power transmitter all the way through a bunch of feed lines. So putting it at right at the tower, and this is the same technique that the upcoming ICOM IC905 is going to use. The, the radio is actually going to live on the tower or the pole right next to the antenna with a very short feed line. And that, that particular unit is going to be um, usable for, let's see, um, two meters, 440, um, 1.2, 2.4, 5.6, and 10 gigahertz. So they 
they just decided they weren't going to deal with feed line losses and they were going to put the radio not very high power radio it's a 10 watt max at two meters and 440 um, at the on the tower so again S, sdmts have very low transmit power etc so these exist but they're uh, they're a bit pricey to have a to get a um, ethernet interface and a and a power over ethernet interface those are pricey now this technique that i described here with a raspberry pi and some software called virtual here basically the raspberry pi acts as a proxy for the usb and it basically just does a protocol translation from usb over to ethernet and then back from ethernet to usb on a host computer and this apparently works very very well the the technique is uh, well well known and this would let you get into this microwave um, software defined radio pretty at a pretty low price point you know if raspberry pi free software and one of the very reasonably priced um, software defined radio such as the adl on pluto which is very popular because it's designed for student uh, engineering students and of course this would work just great with any of the um rtl sdr or, um, dongles um, so you can again put them put them right at the antenna so not much feed line loss so they would be much more sensitive up there now they're <laughs> they're less protected <laughs> No lightning protection, et cetera, et cetera. But fortunately, we don't get that very much here. So those were the the, the uh, things that I decided to share with the group tonight. Uh, this was Bud's idea, and I, I thought it was a great idea. Obviously, this is a lot of fun for me. Um, here's some particulars about zero retries. I've been doing this now every Friday for almost two years now. Um, we're just coming up on... Um, the 100th uh, consecutive issue and just today the reader count crossed 800 um, it's it's free um, no cost there's there will be a subscription tier um, in the not too distant future but all of the content will remain free there's just going to be some extra bennies for um, paid subscribers mm -hmm. and the domain is going to soon switch from zero retries.substack.com to just zero retries.org. I think I'm going to try and do that tomorrow if everything works out okay. And let's see. So this is the landing page for zero retries. Um, all the previous issues are available, and this is what a typical issue looks like. Um, fair amount of text. But I try and throw some uh, illustrations and this is a neat project this is a prototype kind of an exploded packet station with individual boards um, this is a project by a guy named jason roush k4 apr and he only talked about this on facebook um, and i thought that was a shame because it, it needed more exposure so i decided to talk about it in zero reach and jason is also doing this interesting this is a a TNC from a group um, called um, Tarpon, and they they built their own TNC from scratch that would do 600. But it's it's a bit of a treasure hunt um, because you you only when you buy it you only get the circuit board and the processor, um, and then you have to go find all your own components. Mm -hmm. Unlike what you do um, with this group, buds unit so and then so jason decided that it's time that there was an assembled and tested version using soft smt parts so this is his second prototype and it sounds like it's working pretty good and i talk i just talk about the stuff that i find interesting in zero retries hmm. so and, it, and this is one of many things that i'm trying i try to track so i'll stop sharing there Oh, very good. Thank you, Steve. Those are uh, I, I have comments on two of those topics. One, one the uh, the new Alinco radio um, looks like the replacement for the DR two thirty five, which Alinco, which was which was the old 
version of the LN code 220 radio that I have. And I love that radio. It has a, a 220, it, it does have a data connector. Um, and I use it for data, although there, there's hardly anyone to talk to uh, who was who also using data on, on 220. But it's good to know they come, they've come out with a replacement despite the fact that there's no data connector on it. Um, second thing is that the virtual here software, um, I've used a fair amount uh, for my own projects here at home. And we also use virtual here uh, in order to manage the um, repeater, um, the church road repeater. It's a that's a Motorola. Uh, it's Motorola gear, and you program it via a USB interface. So we use virtual here uh, with a Raspberry Pi that's up there next to the repeater, and there's a USB cable that runs from the Raspberry Pi to the um, repeater, and uh, then uh, either Andy or myself or I think Kevin has done it. As, Kevin Snow has done it as well. Ki7kur. Uh, we can SSH into the Raspberry Pi, and over that SSH connection, uh, create a virtual here connection, and then run um, the necessary Windows software in order to program the repeater up there remotely. It's, it works very, very well for that purpose. So, yeah, lots of uses for virtual here. I was thinking that it would be cool to start installing, you know, um, the uh, inexpensive receivers in various places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, vir virtual here is is not free. Uh, you get if you, you, you they do have a free license, but you can only have one USB uh, device on the remote end with with the free license, and that's those, but that's what the use we're using with the Raspberry Pi. But his I. As I recall, his pricing was pretty reasonable. Um, it wasn't that expensive. So yeah, all kinds of ways to use. Can, oh, sorry. Uh, can you run that on like a Pi two zero, whatever this is? <laughs> Pi zero. Uh, w. Uh, yeah. Can you run it on one of these, and then sure. you know throw a hub on there, and then or well, you probably don't you, only need a hub unless you have m multiple things that you want to do, but. I mean, could you run that remotely? Absolutely. Uh, or yes. do you need, or does it have to run on something a little bit more powerful? No, it'll run it, on a Pi Zero. Yep. Rob, Rob, it depends on how much bandwidth you're going to need. If you know, it's if it if it's pumping a lot of data through that USB port, you know, the the Raspberry Pi Zero might not be able to keep up, and you'd want something a little with a little more horsepower. That's that's hmm. that's the limitation on what. The computing devices. Yeah, the virtual I, I here. Just, I, I was going to say the virtual here software itself will run fine on a Pi Zero, but Steve's point is uh, well taken. It depends on how much data you need to pass through the Pi Zero. Okay. Already. Yeah, I was thinking about a couple of uh, SDR plays or SDR dongles mm -hmm. uh, near the antenna instead of having to run long ass uh, coaxes. Yeah. But, the, what, but what there's, are the there's you know a pretty good amount of bandwidth coming off those things, so especially the the SDR uh, play too. Yeah, one of the th things to be aware of if if you're using if you're passing audio over that USB connection through virtual here, that you probably want to be prepared to do some tuning with some buffers, uh, with whatever audio stack you're using because there is some delay uh, introduced uh, the conversion between. Um, I you know IP and and the and USB there's some delay and then when it traverses the the internet or whatever network you have there's some delay as well so some some tuning probably needed there yeah okay the the uh, the original discussion about the um, software defined radios that had the Ethernet the native Ethernet interface is that they they were being used for very you know higher performance stuff. What I thought was interesting about this is that it let you get into that idea, that paradigm at a much lower price point with the, the less expensive stuff that only has a USB interface. All right. So, yeah, that it, it was. <laughs> it looks like a lot of fun. And uh, a, a follow-on comment by a 
a zero retries reader said he just liked having uh he had been using um, the sdrs on his network and he would just you know decide he was going to listen to something and it was living on his network and he thought that was a great idea to be able to extend that particular receiver no. software defined receiver you know up on the pole to have better sensitivity yeah that's an excellent application of, of that that software well are we so that's ready all to i had on? so i'll uh, fade into the background here all right thanks steve um okay i guess that puts you on deck there uh steve okay uh first thing i i want to show you uh yet another tiny tiny pc that i got um on amazon this is a runs a, an intel um celeron chip uh with four cores uh it's got three ultra high definition hdmi connectors on it it's got uh, three USB 3 ports and two gigabit Ethernet adapters. Um, and it runs on 12 volts, uh, around 14 watts it consumes. So uh, for those of you who are can't find a Raspberry Pi or maybe aren't interested in, in diving into the weeds on Linux and all the things that come with a Raspberry Pi, this would be an excellent choice for a Go Kit. Uh, you combine this with a DRA30 or any of the DRA uh, sound cards that Steve was mentioning earlier, or the DigiRig sound card here and connect this to your radio. Uh, it comes with Windows uh, 11 Pro, but it's easy enough to blow that away and put whatever flavor of Linux you want on it also. This, uh, it has eight gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabyte uh, solid state drive. And it was, uh, I, I paid $134 for it on Amazon. I see now that Amazon has it, the price is uh, 189 with a, but, but there's a $40 coupon. The price bump drop, uh, jumps around a lot on these devices, not just on this one, but on, on all these small form factor PCs for some reason. So there, it's $149 at the moment, basically, on Amazon. I'll put a link in the, in the chat uh, to it. So if you're interested in that, excellent. It's excellent. I, I can't detect any noise on my radio from it either. And although it does have a fan, it's silent. Uh, I haven't been able to, and I've done quite a few things on it to bring the CPU up to a high utilization, and I still can't hear the fan on it. So for what that's worth. So that yeah, was topic Bell, number one. Bellingham ACS is shopping for uh, computers, so that might be an option. We might want to talk to you about that. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To give you a size comparison, if that wasn't clear enough, here I'm, I'm putting a Raspberry Pi on top of it. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's really very very small. It would go nicely in a Go Kit, or uh, you know, be a good application where space is is a big deal. Okay. What about uh, ventilation? Hmm? What about heat and ventilation for that? um how how good is that the uh there is a vent in the back and there's a vent all the way around here this is sort of a you can see it it's a little bit uh okay. raised there and the fan is right here so like i said it you know uh, when it's under high load it feels slightly warm to the touch but i you know no more so than any other computer I've used. Okay. It does. It's it. It's definitely cooler running than a Raspberry Pi. Okay. So. All right. Topic number two is I need to share my screen here. All right. 
you, are you guys able to see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So what I'm uh, some time ago I talked about this little Quadra um, computer that was adapted from a, a, a set top box, um, very small form factor PC that runs uh, Armbian. Um, so it, it's an AR, it's an ARM operating system. Uh, it's not doesn't run Raspbian like a Raspberry Raspberry Pi, but it's a similar operating system that's based on Debian, Linux Debian. And um, the folks who release this product, it's a company called Innovato. I think they're out of Oregon, if I recall correctly. Um, just came out with a new release uh, of their image, which is again is based on Armbian. And they have really started to cater to the ham radio crowd. Um, so I haven't done any modifications at all to this. I just installed their latest image on my um, Quadra board. And you can see that they've added a ham radio menu. And they have pre-installed FL Digi, FL Message, FL Rig, JS8 Call, WSJTX, and Pat. And they have an, a fairly nice menuing system to run Pat WinLink with RDOP, with Packet, and allow you to configure Pat as well here. And there's a couple other applications here that I'm not familiar with, Grid Tracker and Ham Clock. I'm not familiar with those. But anyway, um, the device itself, I see their latest price is uh, $35 for this device. Uh, it has a, it comes with an Ethernet port. Uh, it has two USB ports, one USB 3, one USB 2. So you can connect a, a sound card to it, like the DigiRig or one of the DRA sound cards or a signal link to it. And it comes with these applications pre-installed. So um, for those of you still wanting to get a Raspberry Pi and have been unable to do so, um, this might be an alternative. Again, it doesn't run Raspbian, so it, it's not the Nexus image you put on here. This is the image that comes directly from this company called Innovato, but they do pre-install these ham apps, so it might be worthwhile looking into that. And what is that called? Uh, the board is called a Quadra, and the company name, the company that, that has um, taken this set-top box product from this Chinese manufacturer and put Linux on it for general purpose use is called Innovato, I-N-O-V-A-T-O. If you just Google that, uh, it should you know come up pretty close to the top of the search results. Well, I have one of those boxes. I've not, I've not done anything with it yet. I was asking, uh, I was wanting to know where uh, the software, this hand oh, you software. Go, you, oh, you go to their website. It, it, it's their regular image that everybody installs. They just added a ham radio menu to their regular image. Okay, it's, it, it is a special image for ham radio. So is that an SD card that you stick in the side? or? Yes, you... right. You download the image, you burn it to an, S, an SD card, you stick it in, in the, the side of this box, and the installation process then burns the onboard emmc men memory there's 64 i think it's 64 gigabytes of onboard emmc memory on this device so it burns from the sd card to the emmc you remove the micro sd card and then restart this unit and then it runs uh the operating system from its own internal emmc memory oh great mm -hmm. Okay, any questions on that? What's the uh, power requirements on that? Runs on 5 volts. Uh, it has a barrel connector, um, but the operating voltage is 5 volts, not 12 volts. And how many uh, watts does it draw? Oh, hardly any. It's uh, barely measurable on my on my meter. Yeah, because I... Uh... 
I bought something a little bit more beefier. It's this uh, B-Link SEI 12. And I was going to put it in my Go Kit, but it's uh, 17 volts and it draws a lot of power. So it's oh, uh, probably yeah. not going in there. It's not going to be. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got a transformer to step it up and stuff, but or step it. What was it? Uh, step the power down, I mean. Oh. And uh, ah, wait, got him confused. It's been a long day. Uh, anyways, but yeah, it's just uh, too much power draw for a Go Kit. <laughs> Uh, well, you might so you might it. consider the this this PC that I I mentioned earlier. This is an Intel PC, like your B-Link is, but it's quite low power. It runs on 12 volts. Okay, so yeah, I might it, look into that. Yeah, it has a barrel connector in the back, so yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. All right. Second, the third thing, or any other questions? Okay. Uh, third Steve, thing looks Steve, like. I turned your screen share off. You, oh, okay. If you want to put it back on. Yep, I'm going to put it back on here. And I'm going to share uh, just this window here. <clears throat> okay, so I've been doing some work on the, uh, the TNC manager uh, GUI that I programmed some time ago. I've made some uh, what I consider to be insignificant improvements to it. So I wanted to demo that tonight. Um, you'll well, first of all, you'll notice I'm running the uh, uh, the Kenwood script down here, so I can control my uh, TMD710G. So that's already running there, uh, and I will start the new TNC manager. So this is just retrieving all of the settings I've saved for the various applications. Um, in Linux, uh, it's remarkable how many different programs have to be running at the same time in order for you to use Packet. It, it just really is oh, way too complicated. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but that's the way it is. Um, so what I've done is I've... Uh, redone the GUI so that there's a startup tab and you can tell the GUI that says when you start this manager automatically start the TNC which is uh, the collection of programs that includes Direwolf and the AX25 and the KISS attach and and other and other applications that allow you to use the Direwolf Direwolf with your sound card and the AX25 stack that comes in Linux so that's what this box does here. And if you check this box, then it will automatically start PAT, which is a WinLink client designed specifically for Windows and for Linux and for Mac. It operates on all of those platforms. It's written in the Go language. And this checkbox, uh, you can check this if you want to start RDOP when, when this manager starts. Um, I also have an auto start feature here. So if you're using a Nexus DRX, you can tell it which buttons you have, or I'm sorry, which switches you have set in the on position here, and it will automatically create an auto start script for you. Uh, so that let's say I have switches one, three, and four on here, I would select one, three, and four, and then click save here, and it would automatically create a startup script. So the next time my Pi powered on, this manager would automatically start. And then if you had these boxes checked, these applications would also automatically start. Okay. The other change I've made is I've put a save settings button on each of these tabs. And so when you make a change on this page, you save this. This, you're saving specifically the startup settings. Uh, rather than having the buttons down here, uh, which in the past required you to, when you'd hit save, restart the entire application and all the, all the applications uh, like Dara Wolf and, and AX25 in the background. So now uh, each, each, each save is on, on each tab, okay? 
So the GUI doesn't have to restart every time you hit save. There's an AX25 tab where you define the port name. Most hams probably aren't going to mess with this. I create an automatic, or I create an entry called WL2K that's in uh, Etsy AX ports. That's Etsy, Etsy AX25 AX ports, I believe, is the path for this file. And it's, it's a file that's required by AX25 in order to work. And this is where you can set some default values for uh, transmit delay, transmit tail, persist, and slot time. So these are things, these are parameters that are used in the AX25 stack for packet communication. These can be override, overridden by your client. So if you're running WinLink Express, for example, you can specify these parameters in WinLink Express. And when it runs and communicates with Direwolf and AX25 on this Raspberry Pi, it will override these settings and use the settings that you set in WinLink Express. That happens over a KISS connection. OK. And then this button resets some reasonable default values, which I'm already using here. So if you change these and you get to the point where it's really messed up, you can just click this button here and it'll put all these back to the default values. OK. And again, there's a save and apply settings here. So as soon as you make your changes here, you click save and apply settings. And then it restarts the necessary background applications that are using these parameters. So it restarts Direwolf and the AX25 stack, but it doesn't restart the whole GUI like it did before. The RDOP tab has uh, similar parameters here. For those of you who use RDOP, you can select your sound card from whatever sound cards you have plugged into your uh, Raspberry Pi, or if you're using uh, the FiPi, then uh, you use, like it says up here, for the left radio or the right radio, which ones to select, and then which GPIO uh, to use for each radio. OK, and Direwolf, um, this is where the most uh, changes are that I've made here. Um, uh, the one of the changes I made is that you can specify uh, a channels and channel. These are parameters that are part of the uh, direwolf configuration. So uh, if you have a, a a mono sound card, then you select one here, meaning you you have a single channel sound card. And if you have a stereo sound card, you can put two here and then specify which of the two channels, left or right, by using zero or one here. OK, so uh, it's a little bit confusing because the way I, I have the software in the Nexus DRX set up, I have actually split the stereo channels on the FiPi card into their own virtual audio interfaces. So I've created four new virtual interfaces from the stereo FiPi hardware. So there's a FiPi capture left, which means receive audio from the radio on the left channel. A FiPi playback left, that would be transmit audio to the radio on the left channel. And then the same two for the, right, uh, the capture right and, cap and playback right. So the reason I did that is that so you could simultaneously use the left and the right channels with different applications at the same time. Um, if, I, if I didn't do that and I just said, I'll just select the hardware sound card. In other words, I go to this list and I say, oh, this is my FiPi, I'll just use this. Well, even though it's a stereo sound card, uh, if you select this, uh, you can't use, you have to t tell it, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to use the stereo sound card, uh, FIPI sound card, uh, with my left radio. Well, now you can't use the right radio because this 
hardware is tied up with this application working only on the left side. Okay, so that's why I made these virtual audio interfaces here. So you can use left and right Bravo, side. Bravo, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other changes, this is where you set the PTT. This is where you set the modem. Um, the Direwolf software TNC allows you to use these different modems. They're different modulation schemes, 1200 being the most common. That's AFSK uh, at 1200 hertz and 2200 hertz. I think those frequencies are correct. Um, but there are other, there is a, a, a G, uh, I can't remember. Uh, there is a 9600 scheme as, or a modulation demodulator demodulator built into direwolf that operates at 9600 as well this isn't vara ruh thank you g3 ruh so if you select this direwolf will use its g3 ruh modem okay and obviously the station that you're communicating with also has to be using that modem i have tested this at 9600 by the way uh, with a station that I have remote control of that's not very far away. It's over in Bell uh, the Bellingham Technical College. And it does work. Works pretty well, and it's quite fast. I temporarily changed that station to, to 9600 and ran these tests. Um, you can specify the AGW port or the KISS port, which allows other applications to communicate with Direwolf. Um, uh, Winlink Express, for example, uses KISS to communicate with Direwolf over the network. Uh, the CDigiP, C filter, and C beacon fields allow you to um, turn your Raspberry Pi into a packet repeater. So uh, I worked with Bud and Rob on this some time ago. Um, where I think Bud was trying to communicate with a repeater and he couldn't get there, but he could if he repeated through, or, or I'm sorry, an RMS gateway. Uh, but he could get to that RMS gateway if he repeated through Rob, if I recall. That was the scenario that we were, we were trying to solve. So I put these features in here that allow you to communicate, to set up a Digipeter. And you can see right now that I am advertising the fact that my setup here at home is a Nexus DRX DigiPeter. It's just broadcasting that every 15 minutes, which is set right here. And the info I'm, setting, I'm sending is in this info equals text field here. So I can change that to whatever I want. Okay. And then uh, this field here is for other arguments that are part of the direwolf configuration. Now, one thing I've removed from the previous GUI is the sample rate. I usually have, yeah, I used to have a drop down here. I decided to move that over here into arguments, and uh, because it's more in line with the way direwolf works, you can specify the data rate on the command line. So I made that a command line argument. This is the default value for the command line. So it says use a sample rate of 48,000, which is going to be dependent on your sound card. Um, it says uh, use text color number two, which you can see over here. This is uh, outputting in a terminal here, and you can see there's different colors. This is a feature of Direwolf. You can select one of two or three different color schemes for the different kinds of events that direwolf produces so it'll print in color over here and then minus d uo is uh the debug mode it just tells you how verbose and what kind of information you want direwolf to print okay and i've added uh, i've improved the help here so if you click help it'll open a web interface um that talks about all these tabs and all the settings in them and in the direwolf uh section here the direwolf tab is the arguments field if you click on that 
you'll see all the arguments that you can use with with direwolf. Okay, so that's a reference. You can get the same thing if you open a terminal window and you type uh, direwolf space minus h. We'll also print out this information. Okay. Um, now, optionally, uh, all of these fields here, with the exception of the arguments fields, when you fill all this information out, what what this does when I apply when I select save and apply settings, is it creates its own direwolf configuration file, and it's using that file to uh, configure direwolf dire based on these parameters. Some of you might want to do something more complex with direwolf, and there are a lot of things you can do that are more complex than I've exposed here. You can actually type minus C and put the name of your custom direwolf configuration file here, like that, for example. Okay, so if you do that and you click save and apply, all of these settings here, with the exception of the argument field, are ignored. And it's going to read your direwolf configuration file and use that. Okay, so that gives you a lot more flexibility than the, than the old way. So I'm going to take that out because I'm not using it at the moment. And again, save and apply will restart direwolf but it doesn't restart the GUI. Uh, the PAT uh, page, um, or the tab rather, you, you can put your call sign in there, your WinLink password. Press this button if you want to edit your password in visible text rather than these uh, dots here, your location code. All of this stuff is pretty much the same as last time. Uh, the things that are new, however, I've given you the option of when you start PAT, whether or not you want to enable an AX25 listener. So this came about as a result of a troubleshooting project that I did with Bud and Mick, um, where we were trying to communicate uh, to an RMS gateway, and he was running PAT on that RMS gateway with the same call sign that the R of the RMS gateway. So um, the, he, he would, the, the, it wouldn't work because he had a client and a server basically trying to talk to each other with the same call sign. So if you want to use Pat in that way as a test, for example, you can uncheck this AX25 listener and still use Pat to send email and receive email. Okay, by turning the listener on, you are, your station is now listening for incoming email uh, from another point-to-point -point station. Okay, so if you shut this off, it won't listen. It won't reply. Even if somebody tries to communicate with AG7GN, uh, there won't be any reply from me. But if another station at this moment, because I have this checked, uh, tried to communicate with me, uh, directed to uh, uh, set up for WinLink point to point to AG7GN, my station would reply because I'm listening uh, on my AX25 listener. Okay. Same thing is true for Telnet. So if somebody tried to communicate with my station over my IP connection, for example, I would respond to that request. And I also have uh, the option of turning it on for RDOP. So I could leave my station running, turn this on, make sure my radio is tuned to the appropriate frequency, and somebody could connect to me when link point, point to point over RDOP. So I can have all three of these on, or any one of the three, or any two of the three, any combination. And the rest of these are the same as before, different uh, RDOP um, parameters uh, that are configurable within PAT. And again, uh, the help uh, brings up a web interface that explains what all these fields are and points you to some additional documentation uh, online if you, if you want it. OK. The last tab is rig control. 
Um, rig control is a little bit complicated with Pat. Um, uh, I, I kind of abstracted it from this GUI a little bit, and I just put a button here that says Manage Ham Live Rig Control. So I can, if I click this button, it actually brings up another GUI that isn't really part of it. And it gives you the status of what rig control is doing. So currently, I have selected a rig called FL Rig that comes with the Hamlib um, system. And what this does is it it is designed to communicate with FL with FL Rig, which is normally used uh, for CAC control with FL Digi. Well. On my controller software here, I wrote it so that it looks like FL Rig to other applications. So when I set up FL Rig here, it thinks it's talking to the actual FL Rig software, when in my case, it's actually talking to my Kenwood GUI. Okay, it uses XML RPC and communicates uh, over the network connection here. But if you go into this field, you can put in, uh, well, let's say Kenwood, right? If I just start typing Kenwood, these are all of the rigs that Hamlib supports and you can use with rig control. So there's a lot of rigs in here. You can select the one you want uh, and you can select the serial ports that this GUI has detected on your system. Obviously, if you have um, a rig you want to control, with Hamlib, it has to be over, either over a network connection, over your Ethernet connection, or via serial port. So you can select the serial port here, and then the uh, the serial speed here. Okay, and then when you're done, you just restart. It saves these settings, so the next time you start the T and C GUI, it'll automatically start the uh, the appropriate rig rig control setting uh, that you use the the in the, the previous time you ran the program. And this button just shows the current status of, uh, of Rig Control D. Okay, so this is available now. If you go on to the Nexus updater and you select uh, Direwolf Utils, uh, it'll download and install this. Um, it'll replace your old one automatically your old TNC manager if you had previously installed it with this new version. Steve, what about our current settings? Will that all will, will this affect the current setup that we've got? Or do we have to uh, it it should honor your current settings. Um, it will make some assumptions about some new parameters. Uh, that I've introduced in this version. So you'll you'll want to go through each of these each of those tabs and make sure that they're they're set correctly and change them if you need to. Which means you probably should go look at those tabs or look at your current settings and make sure you've got a record of those before you update. That's an all always a good idea. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Looks like I've got more head homework for myself now. <laughs> uh, let's see. I, yeah, I think that covers it for me. Great work. Well, appreciate it. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, does anybody else have anything that they'd like to talk about this evening? Oh, sounds like there's not a lot of a uh, lot to go on. And, well, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Add something. I know a couple of you. I, I think I've told. <laughs> been trying to get this uh, GLINet 4G modem to work for my trip. <clears throat> Finally got it about an hour or a couple hours ago to work with the new SIM card that just came in. Uh, so I'm now on T-Mobile, which of course I'm driving through Nevada, so half the state's not gonna be accessible, or at least T-Mobile's not gonna be 
accessible through half that state. <laughs> uh, but at least I'll have uh, network internet access for all my gear that I'll be running on the way down there and telemetry stuff. And I'm planning on running a bunch of experiments and stuff while I'm driving down there, intercepting signals and whatnot. And uh, so for those that I told that uh, I've been pulling my hair out, see, uh, trying to get this thing to work that I've had for a couple of weeks. Um, and I'm also going to be trying to run Arden uh, live as I'm <clears throat> streaming my trip. Well, well, not streaming, but uh, APRS I'll have live as well all the way down. So if anybody wants to keep track of me, you're welcome to it. I'll, I'll send out the link if anybody's interested to whoever's interested. So. Rob, you um, you were angling for for a job with the NSA. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Just 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 checking. That wouldn't work there. That's too low brow. <laughs> you guys are much cooler. If you, if you guys, if you guys want to see a amazing project that you would think would be an NSA project, except it's being done by a ham, look up KA9Q radio. He basically virtualizes a software-defined receiver and splits it out into multiple virtual receivers. And he's, he's, he's basically listening to every repeater in the San Diego area all simultaneously. It's an amazing project. Hmm. What was his call sign? Kilo Alpha Niner Quebec. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, anything, last chance, gentlemen, anything you want to talk about? Yeah, David. I just got a question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, a question about that link that uh, Steve has up there for s small form factors. In the chat. It, uh, yeah. Just clicked on it, and they want uh, it shows a computer that costs two hundred and seventy dollars. Is that the one you're? No, uh, that was the price he was talking about. No, I just clicked on the link myself, and it brought up the same computer. It, it, the The current price is one eighty nine ninety, uh, but there's a coupon you clip right below it for forty dollars, so it's one forty nine ninety. It's okay. gone up ten dollars since I bought it, but like I said, the the price bounces around a lot on these uh, computers. What's it called? Is it called uh, Ace Magician? Nope, C Tone. It's a C-Tone uh, Mini Micro PC. I just clicked on the link and it went right to it. Um, That's weird. Because I I just clicked on the link let me, and it. Let me open it in a different browser here and make sure. Uh, Steve, it it goes to the. I just copy and pasted it into my browser and it's. It's definitely going to the C tone. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, I just opened it another browser yeah. too, and it went it went right there. Yeah. M Amazon will sometimes selectively apply a sponsored link in advance. You know, at, at, in this in that page. So yeah, it, it it's been known to happen. Thoughtful, thoughtful of them. David, have you been paying too much lately? <laughs> because, have I been what? You know. They may be targeting you specifically because you're, you know, you're overpaying for things. That's a completely different computer that I've got coming up there. So uh, we'll hmm. see. What, um, what did you call it again, Steve? I'm sorry. I didn't... C tone. C tone. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the letter C. Yeah. I'll do it the hard way and find it. Did you copy it directly out of chat? 
I clicked on the, the chat. Yeah. And did you copy it and then paste it into a browser? I did that also. Yes. Okay. David, if you scroll down, will you find it? I clicked on it and it went right to the right spot, but I think Amazon is allowing a sponsor to put something in front of you. Ah, okay. All right, well, anything else, gentlemen? All right, well then, Bud, you wanna pull the plug? See you guys. Adios. Yeah, I want to really thank Galen for uh, rescuing the MC job for me because my voice does not hold out for any length of time at all. And I appreciate um, all the contributions from both of the Steves. And uh, we'll give anybody a last chance to speak up or I'll pull the plug and we will have uh, recordings available when I can get there. Okay, uh, very good. It was a good one. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Right. Bye.